Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Jenny Pearson. I'm an education officer from the Primary Health Network. Today, our webinar is an overview of ACE and residential aged care. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. I'm coming to you from Enawan land in the Northern Tablelands. Uh, we have uh, four speakers for you today. We have Rosalind Baker. Rosalind is the CNC for the Aged Care Emergency and Residential Aged Care in Reach Service with Hunter New England Health. Lee Darcy. Lee is the Service Man Manager Aged Care Services for Hunter Primary Care. Kate Lupton. Kate is the Bereavement Coordinator for Hunter New England Health and Viv Allenson, who is a CEO, Director of Care at Maroba. Uh, we do have a question box, so if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to type in um, your questions and we'll endeavour to ask them throughout the webinar. The webinar is being recorded and a copy of it will be available on our website in our education calendar. Uh, there will be a very quick a generic evaluation that will pop up at the end of the webinar. We would love you to fill it in. It only takes about 30 seconds and we just love to get people's feedback. All right, um, I think Rosalind Barker is our first presenter. So I'll hand over to you, Ros. Hello, and thank you so much, Jenny, uh, for the introductions. So. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands we're meeting on. I'm a meeting on a Wabakal land today here in Newcastle, and I um, can pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge any Aboriginal people with us today on the meeting. Uh, today we're going to, as publicised, we're going to give you a bit of an update on or refresher on what is ACE, what's ACE all about. Um, also a bit of a brief, uh, information around the ED catchments, our home EDs, and also some exciting news about a new in-reach service that we're just starting up. Um, and then Lee Darcy from the Hunter Primary Care. Uh, Lee's going to talk about the after hours arrangements with ACE. And then we've got Kate, who's going to speak about advanced care directives. And also I've asked Viv to speak to us about the the challenges that um, are experienced from an aged care perspective and just um, so we can better understand some of the limitations. So thank you all. I hope you've enjoyed. So before we start, I just want to I always use this photo because it we need to come sometimes just just pause and remember the beautiful people that we're all caring for in aged care facilities. Uh, these people have worked and lived for many years and they've cared for many, many people and we've been cared by them also. So it's just an acknowledgement of, you know, what we're doing. We're working with these aged care, the um, older people in aged care and acknowledge all the wonderful work that the aged care facilities do. Um, is the emergency department always the right place? This is actually a real gentleman and no, it's not always the right place. And so from an ambulance perspective, I'm sure sometimes you um, are um, transferring people from the residential aged care facility into an ED and thinking, is this the right place and I'm taking this person? For example, this poor gentleman, in his last years of life, he year of life, he had multiple presentations, admissions, endoscopes, x-rays, ultrasounds, bloods. And the saddest thing is he died in the emergency department alone. Um, and that we all know that our aged care facilities have wonderful um, palliative care. So um, no, we so every transfer that we are that you're working that you're um, doing and it's about is this the right place and the residential aged care facility is off is the right place for at many times but re remembering that um, many of these people in aged care do have chronic conditions and 
will deteriorate or will have a, an exacerbation and they do need access to emergency care and so um, these are some of the complications when a person does um, come into the hospital situation or to the busy ED or when they're you know being delayed and you know, haven't off you're unable to offload um, in their emergency department the people uh, may become um, confused a delirium you know, they can deconditioning a bit um, just sitting around in bed the sarcopenia disorientation falls pressure injury. So these are all the things that can and do occur to our elderly people when they're coming to hospital, unfortunately. Just a quick background to what ACE is all about. So in 2009, um, it was noticed that there were people from aged care facilities coming in with low acuity problems. And with that, um, there were some focus groups um, with the aged care facilities, um, the GPs and, and uh, the EDs. And um, it was the situation was discussed. It was identified that we need to improve relationships and understanding because the emergency the emergency departments are very busy and are not the ideal place for an aged care facility uh, a resident. But also, <clears throat> in an aged care facility, they don't have access to a medical officer easily. They don't have a big impress with all the medication easily accessible. They don't have the emergency buzzer to press and, you know, a response team comes along. So there's different um, perspectives. And from, um, it was also um, suggested that we have a telephone service. So the ACE service now, it has a 24 hour hotline aged care for the aged care facility staff. So they can ring the 24 hour hotline um, and so they speak to the emergency department Monday to Friday during the day and they speak to Hunter Primary Care after hours. We've also got standardised algorithms for um, most commonly presenting problems like for a fall or constipation and um, we've also put in place within the emergency department um, the asset nurses who are aged care emergency um, trained staff who are able to support the facilities. So um, goals of care, we'll talk about that, and standards eyes transfer. So all this started in 2009 and we've been building on it ever since. So Hunter, um, the ACE program is a partnership between the Hunter Primary Care, the Hunter New England Central Coast, the Primary Health Network, and Hunter New England. But we work closely with ambulance and I'm all often speaking to your health relations managers and um, just, you know, with different difficult situations or just giving us a heads up. So that's great that we continue to work on our relationship. Um, ACE is about right care, right place. And um, by doing that, what we do is we build, it's about building capacity with the aged care facility staff so they are able to provide the care to the residents in the facilities. We have lots of um, clinically focused resources. We have lots of uh, interagency meetings. And um, by doing that, improving the communication and collaboration, we have been able to reduce unnecessary transfers to the emergency department. So ACE isn't about denying access to care. Everybody in our community has the right to care. And um, ACE is optional for our residential aged care facilities. So they don't have to ring ACE as such, but we love it when we can help them to ensure that the person has the right care at the right place. So within Hunt New England, there's 10 emergency department sites that participate in ACE. And they're stretched across the region, up in the New England, Manning, and then um, the Greater Newcastle and Singleton, Cessnock, Maitland. Um, and as I said, the ED staff answer the calls during the day and um, Hunter Primary Care do uh, answer the calls after hours and on public holidays. Um, so we have a website, we have many resources. We have a website 
and we have our manual and with that um, there's lots of tools, there's an ISVA form, there's, um, and if you have suggestions for information to be um, placed on our ACE website, please feel free to send it through, I'd love to add it. Um, so there's lots of information and resources to support our aged care facility staff. And you're most welcome to access these. Um, the evidence, we have evidence-based algorithms, so these are reviewed every three years. And um, so we, the facility, by the facilities, by our partners like Hunter, Hunter Primary Care, the ambulance, and then they go to all the clinical streams and networks within Hunter New England, like the, the people responsibility for all the diabetes, um, they review those. And our quality use of medicines to review anything that has medication involved. So just, and the reason why I'm adding that, there's a governance around our, yeah, algorithms so with that if staff work within the algorithm then they're supported by Hunter New England Health um, and the facility staff and you know with your assistance as well you know you might prompt them to say hey have you looked at the ACE manual um, you know, there is a, there's an algorithm on that so within ACE one of the big requirements, I think, um, is goals of care. So what is it that um, the person's coming to the, med to the emergency department for? Why are you transporting that person to the emergency department? So to understand that, we need to understand what type of phase of care is this person in? So are they for curative treatment? Are there any care limitations for this person? Um, or are they for restorative treatment to get them back to where they were with some treatment limitations? You know, so, so, so Mary can would go back to having her wheelie walker, you know, and walk to the, the dining room every morning because that's what she likes to do. Um, or is the person for palliative care, uh, for management, of their symptoms and quality of life. So, you know, meaning that palliative, um, yes, they have fractured their neck of femur. We're going to bring them into hospital and we're going to do a pin and plate. They can tolerate an anaesthetic and they're able to get back and to be able to be managed in the facility. They may not be able to use the walker anymore to get to the dining room, but they're going to be pain-free and they can still continue to have quality of life. Or are they for terminal care? Are they for uh, like care of the dying, the end of life? So this is around, um, they wouldn't be having uh, if it's within days of death, they wouldn't be having a um, an open reduction pin and plate total hip replacement, but for, at the same time, they might be having a, a a femoral block to stop the pain, or if you know if end of life is in a week or so, and they can tolerate, we would you know, even explore maybe um, some type of you know stabilization of the fracture so they weren't in pain and, and it's about quality of life. So the reason why we're going through those is so when the person comes to the emergency department, what is it that we're going to do? And what would you like? There's there's a story of this poor gentleman who came to the ED and you know we did the X the um, ECG and X-rays and you know um, looked at it looked the whole you know assessment. He had a sore hip. He went back to the facility. He said he still had his sore hip, but he had a uh, pacemaker for his for his heart block. So we fixed his heart, but we didn't fix the main problem. We didn't fix his goal of care, which was his sore hip. Um, within the aged care facilities there and the manual, we utilise the uh, the principles of between the flags. So we've identified what is normal for this person or for an older person what is uh, within the yellow which you know should you need to monitor more closely or what is in the red what's an emergency 
So encouraging the facilities to do the odds, but also to compare to baseline. We always talk about the baselines. So the, although this person you know, may, their blood pressure may be within the normal range, they have normally are very hypertensive. So, um, and then chronic disease management plans. Many of our residents in facilities do have chronic disease management plans. So, you know, when you're coming in, um, maybe you could um, prompt and ask to review the chronic disease management plan. Um, because it's been found that about 30, um, up to 40% of transfers can be avoided if there are adequate um, plans in place because people from facilities will deteriorate and they will have exacerbations and they will need to be taken to hospital. And as I said before, this is the best place for many of these people. Um, when you go into the facility from, um, I'm hoping that you get receive an ISPA handover from our residential aged care facility staff. So um, we, ACE, we go out um, you know, and provide education and Lee has been doing a lot of education in relation to the ISPA and the idea behind it is so this information, they, the more information the GP obtains, the better he informate, better guidance and plan he can put in place. Similarly, um, from yourselves, you know, if you have a clear understanding of what's the background and the situation, and then similarly with the emergency department, it'd be great when you uh, do bring a person into the ED that you could um, hand over the ISPA that you have received from the facility. And of course, identifying the goals of care. So this is just a snapshot of the, uh, the ISPA form that the facilities use. Um, just to run through uh, a typical if a person is unwell. So this is the ACE flowchart. So is the person unwell? Yes. Uh, is it life threatening? Uh, yes, if, so if it were life-threatening, the first thing is do they have an advanced care directive and does that directive limit treatment for that person? Some directives may say, you know, not for transfer to hospital, not for CPR, not for um, active treatment. So if that's the case, then you would revert to the man ACE manual and provide, um, you know, in, to ensure quality of life and hopefully explore the options that are available. But if it were, obviously it's a triple O response and you guys come, thank you. Um, and then we have, so hopefully they will resolve the problem. They'll go through the manual and say, okay, it's constipation and we've done this, this, this wonderful result, everything's good. Or uh, if not, they'll speak to the GP. And this where sometimes gets a bit tricky because often the GP isn't always readily available. Not always though, but they may not be readily available. And so is the GP unavailable? No, that's when they ring ACE prior to ringing for an ambulance. Um, they provide an ISBA and hopefully um, the ACE staff can provide some assistance and some guidance and hopefully the person doesn't need to come to hospital. But if they do, that's okay. The facility will ring the ambulance. Or if the GP uh, is available and the GP says, yeah, just send them in, um, we still like the facility to give us a ring so we know to expect the person because we can pre uh, prepare. But also sometimes we can um, you know, intervene, give advice and maybe think of some alternatives. Um, for the person to coming into hospital. Okay, so calling an ambulance. So the ambulance, the aged care facility read the ambulance and um, we would like them to inform you that they have called ACE and ACE has said, yes, send them in and we'll expect the person. And that will, and that also we would like the facility to let you know which facility, which uh, emergency department the, is the resident going to. So if the 
as I said before, within during the daytime, the facility rings, say, Belmont ED. So the Belmont ED nurse and in conjunction with the doctor have said, yes, um, send this person in and we'll put, start to prepare. So it'd be really great if the facility could let you know that Belmont ED is expecting the residents and for the resident to go to Belmont because there's been of late, I know there's been a bit of um, uh, offload delays and demands and things like that. But if where possible, it would be great if the facility, if the resident went to the catchment ED, please. And when the ED, when the paramedics arrive, when you arrive, it'd um, be great if you were able to have that handover and then yellow envelopes. Yellow, so we have yellow envelopes with in the facilities and I list the information required in the emergency department and in the hospital to be sent on through. Sometimes they go missing. I'm not sure what happens. Facilities say, yeah, I sent it in. ED say, well, I didn't say it. So I don't know what happens there. They just kind of vanish sometimes in transit. Um, but it's a really great um, way for the emergency department to receive information, hand over, and of course it's got East Bar in it. And hopefully it has a most advanced care directive. We also have information around if somebody has a, uh, a dementia and um, it's really important for us to understand things like the top five strategies. What is it that I can do to calm this person if they're becoming distressed? What do I do if they're calling out for their deceased loved one? So maybe this is something that you guys could also adopt the top five strategies and or to encourage, um, you know, when you're transferring people from the residential aged care facility, just to get a bit of a, an understanding of, is this something that may cause some distress, you know, sudden noises, different ethnic backgrounds, that type of thing. So you can be prepared and, and try to, you know, provide the, to reassure the person and de-escalate any potential behaviours. So catchments. Each residential aged care facility in the greater Newcastle region has catchments so we can have continuity of care. So with that I mentioned before, if there's a phone call to Belmont, Belmont Hospital is expecting that person and it would be wonderful if Belmont Hospital received that person. And also the another reason is we look at the number of aged care facilities within each catchment and then we look at the number of beds. We have to try to even that out because there are, did you know, across Hunter, New England, there's over 10,000 beds in aged care facilities. So it's really hard, you know, so we have to manage this demand to ensure we're not overloading one hospital. In the regional areas, so Armadale, Tamworth, Manning, Cessnock and um, Singleton, we don't have home EGs, okay, um, but everywhere else we do. So um, obviously you won't be able to read the fine print, but just it would be wonderful if you could be mindful of these home EDs so we can ensure that we're not um, sending all the patients to the Calvary Mater and I don't know why, but they seem to receive the most out of catchment area transfers. Um, but, there's always a but, <laughs> so except when the person is experiencing a life-threatening emergency like a triple O response from you guys um, and that's when the matrix kicks in and um, it will determine the residence hospital and ED destination. So this is something, you know, obviously um, that you're aware of. But also when a resident condition requires specialist treatment or a specialist hospital, for example, if it's a fractured neck of femur, uh, the Calvary Mater don't do that. So we'd have to ensure that transfer went to John Hunter. Similarly, Belmont don't do 
crash um, NOFs. Um, but with that, um, risk fractures can be managed in the in the home ADs. Um, Belmont Calvary can do that quite fine. Mental health is another one. So some of our hospitals are not scheduled, so therefore they can't keep a person who is um, who is under a schedule. So with that, Belmont Hospital is not un, uh, cannot and nor can Armadale, but I know there's local arrangements up there and I'm sure the local team um, know that, the arrangements there. Um, just out of interest, in relation to mental health, so mental health is different to an acute delirium. So I, I understand you're often um, phoned to transport somebody in an acute delirium and delirium which may have been result of a medical problem it's still that person is still should go to the home ed because it's a medical problem and they require a medical assessment and they need an um, intervention and that is not a mental health condition otherwise people are coming to, uh, being taken to the martyr and unfortunately it's a not a mental health and because it's not a mental health illness they are just being admitted to the, the Calvary Mart Awards, not going to mental health. Um, if and if the resident is sent to a specialist hospital, of course the ED nurse will let the specialist hospital know that they're transferring if they've taken a call. Um, just some evaluations that we have done and just quickly I need to hurry and um, let you know some exciting news that Hunter New England, we've secured 12 months of funding to provide some um, outreach service into the aged care facilities. So this, um, hopefully we can continue after the 12 months, but um, we're optimistic. So the teams that will be providing that specialised urgent care to facilities um, in the facility for the resident and to reduce those unnecessary transfers to hospital and also to reduce the um, complications that the person is exposed to when they come, do come to the emergency department. So we'll use the same ACE line, so from a facility perspective it's all the same um, and we'll operate seven days a week, eight to four. And I'm really excited to say that today I had new four new staff start, so that's really great, and two next practitioners there's access to a geriatrician. Um, we have a physio three days a week and a CMO, like a medical officer as well. Um, and we're located in Newcastle West. Um, and so it's three stage implementation. We started 10 days ago also. Um, for the Belmont and the John Hunter catchments, and then we'll start Calvary Mater and Tomare in a couple of weeks, and then Manning. Manning will be mainly um, virtual care and telephone, but we will have some um, outreach into the facility. So, but also um, from an ambulance perspective, we're working really closely with the BCCC to develop a referral pathway for this new service. So that's really great. So we'll start getting some referrals from you guys. Uh, and also, I'm not sure if you know, but um, Hunter New England, we've just started a mobile x-ray service, which goes out to aged care facilities, which will reduce the need to send somebody to hospital for an x-ray. Unfortunately, it's only in the Newcastle area at this stage, but it, that's a huge, huge change and the um, the mobile x-ray service are mindful of the other uh, facilities and region across our across Hunter New England and looking at um, how can we expand this so that's a really exciting thing thank you so much now um, I won't ask for questions but what I will do I'll hand over to Lee Darcy who's the service manager in the Hunter primary care to speak about the after hours arrangements in ACE Um, hi everyone, um, I 
think Ros is going to stop sharing. I think. Um, I'm not get, I'm not going to take too long. Um, and I haven't got any slides. I just wanted to add in what that what the arrangements are in the afternoon. Um, so ACE is a 24 seven uh, hour seven day a week service. Um, Hunter Primary Care manage those calls in the after hours. So from four o'clock on weekdays, weekends, and public holidays, um, with the exception of the RACI sites. Um, it is a nurse-led service, um, so it's for decision support, um, a clinical assessment, um, and just that triage. If um, the, especially for our, our um, junior nurses in the aged care homes, it's really um, supportive for that as well. Also, clinical handover if they're going to um, need to be transferred to the hospital. So we do encourage the um, staff to uh, undertake a ISBAR clinical assessment prior to um, making the call um, so that we can um, have that collaborative discussion around what occurs for that person. So it's most important they are the one, people that know the resident's um, uh, baseline health care. So uh, health, sorry, and, it, and it's really important that they um, participate in that discussion about where that person's health status is at that time. So we utilise the clinical pathways that are available in, through the ACE and through the community um, uh, health pathways. And we are just always about that right care, right time, right place. And in the after hours that can be limited um, if the GP is not accessible. Um, sometimes in the after hours, we do have um, a GP on call that's, a, that's part of the, um, uh, that's if the doc GP is part of the GP access and that's uh, their deputising service. So that's usually Newcastle, Maitland region that, that may be available. So you can have um, some uh, people in, an aged care home and even it's sharing the same room perhaps and um, one will be have access to that doctor on call, one, one won't. So that sometimes does happen, which is a bit frustrating for everyone when that's um, not available, but you know, that's um, the way it is. Um, so yeah, really just about that right care, right time, right place. Um, so we do get quite a large number of calls in the, um, after hours call center, they don't select, they just automatically, um, when they ring the ACE line, go straight to our call center in the after hours um, and they go into a queue. So um, the, the call center manages quite a large number of calls from public as well as the ACE line, um, urgent pathology, et cetera. So they're dealing with a lot of calls. Um, they probably manage around on average, um, 200 calls um, a month in that after hours period. Um, and 40% of the time, the, those um, um, persons are, are managed in primary care. So they do a really good um, job with that. Um, but that's all I really have to say. So I'm not sure who's presenting um, next, but it could be. So next we have Kate Lovgen, Bereavement Coordinator within Hunter New England. Thank you, Kate. Hi, everybody. This afternoon, I um, just wanted to give a quick overview of um, advanced care planning, advanced care directives. Um, death is, we don't talk about death very well. Thanks, Jen. Um, and thank you. We don't, yeah, we don't talk about death very well. It's still a bit of a t taboo subject. Um, but when you think about it, death's a guarantee. If there's any gamblers listening, well, the odds are pretty good that you're going to die unless somebody develops some drug for us to live together. So having conversations about end of life reduces a lot of fear for people um, talking about it and also gives us better choice and control 
and saves a lot of questions for medical practitioners. Thanks, Jen. So an advanced care plan is is really about those conversations about what you know what you want to do at the end of your life um, when you are coming to the end of the life and about your medical treatment. So I want to talk about that briefly. Do you really need it? What's the difference between an advanced care plan and an advanced care directive? And how do I do an advanced care directive? Thanks, Jen. This is a short video that gives you a little bit of an idea about why we should be prepared. I don't think there's any sound. Was the sound coming through? No. Okay, just hold on one second, if everyone can just give us a minute. Um. I think it's on mute, Jenny. Okay, let me try again. My Thank name you. is Anita and John is my dad. My name's John, uh, I'm Quibby's husband. So Roy gets to go on a trip of a lifetime. Where does he want to go? <laughs> um, I'd say Bora Bora. <laughs> no, I definitely want to go with Bora Bora. What food could Anita not live without? Probably um, curry. Anything Asian? <laughs> he couldn't live without a lot of food. And what about you? What food could you not live without? Probably fruit in general. Probably chocolate. <laughs> <Just> chocolate. <laughs> okay. Anita asked me, so what's this about? <laughs> If you can think about a moment where you pushed through a hard time together, can you describe that? At school, when she was being bullied, we had to see some counselling. Just talking me through it and helping me get through it. Kind words and lots of hugs. <laughs> For me, it was probably the time that we were first trying to have a, our, our first child, I guess. Uh, we went through IVF and, and things like that. Becoming parents is something that we all hoped would come naturally, but it didn't to us initially, and we worked through that together. Roy's hurt in a car accident. He needs a breathing tube for the rest of his life, and he'll never speak again. Would you consent to this? Well, yeah, I would, yeah. No, I wouldn't. Definitely not. I don't think I would want to put burden anyone with that. So I'd rather not. <laughs> yeah. And need to have three months to live. Treatments would give her an extra two months, but she would never see outside of a hospital. Would you consent to treatment? Yes, this was a difficult one. This one, two months, you know, it's just one week, two months, any any time. Not at all. <laughs> no. That's unexpected. I don't, I don't want to be kept in the hospital for forever. John has had a massive stroke. Does he want a feeding tube to keep him alive, even though he'll never talk again? No. No, I don't. Um, it's very important to me to be happy and functional in my life. No, I wouldn't want that to happen. Roy's in the last stages of terminal cancer and his heart stopped. Does he want CPR? Probably not. I don't think he would, no, I don't know.
So how do you both feel after um, answering those questions and why? I felt quite, it felt quite um, confronting in a way. Um, but you think about it and you talk about it just very lightheartedly, but I don't think anyone really mm. puts a lot of thought and, and serious thought into it. No. Why do you think that some couples don't talk about this? It's not a pleasant subject. I mean, nobody wants to, to dwell on the fact that they're going to die one day and possibly in adverse or difficult circumstances. So if I was to tell you that advanced care planning is essentially a conversation that helps your loved ones know what medical treatment to choose for you if you had a sudden event, what would you think about it now? I think it's a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. It's important, not just for yourself, but more so for your family, I think. Definitely have to have a bit more of a talk. And it's not just about the two of us. We it's also have kids, kids and all that kind yeah. of stuff, yeah. So there is a bit we need to consider, consider yeah, 100%. Yeah. Thanks, Jenny. Can you see my screen, Kate? No. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank so as we saw in that video, it can be confronting talking about death. Um, and as I said before, we don't do it. Uh, we plan births, but we don't plan deaths. But we think we know our loved ones, um, but when it comes down to those choices at the end of the life, it, if you had an advanced care directive, it would make it much easier for your family and loved ones, but also you would have the choice yourself. Thank you. So what is advanced care planning? It's about you, what's important to you, your values. It documents your choices so your loved ones will know what decisions about your care if you're not able to do, to do so. But you don't have to have a terminal illness to start talking to your loved ones and health professionals about your wishes. We don't want to leave it too late. And it makes it clear to those significant to you what treatment you would want and what you wouldn't. It's been shown that health outcomes for people and their families improve when they're able to talk through their concerns, decisions, preferences and choices with health professionals. And it takes that fear away. Thanks, Jen. So people will say, why do I need an advanced care plan? I have a will, but a will can only come into effect after you die. And during guardian as well, um, you think that enduring guardian is all you need, but what about if the, you're in, you and your enduring guardian were in an accident? Your enduring guardian died, who would make those decisions? An advanced care plan, an advanced care directive makes it very clear on what you would like at the end of your life. Thanks, Jen. So a bit about an advanced care directive. It's part of the advanced care planning. It can't be overridden by a health professional or a person responsible but it needs to be written while you have capacity. In New South Wales, you can write it on a piece of paper, not have a witness, but it's recommended that they're signed and witnessed while you have capacity. 
there is a um, a form that is accessible through Hunter New England Intranet website, and also even if you just Googled Advanced Care Directives, there's a form that you can have. And the more we do this and the more we talk to people about it, the more people have their choices at the end of their life. Thanks, Jen. What's the difference between the plan and a directive? So an advanced care plan, somebody could write that on your behalf and it, it's generally a guide. Um, you can do it verbally, you can talk to your family, um, your children or your loved ones um, about it. But an advanced care directive has to be made when you're an adult with decision-making capacity and it must be followed. Nobody can override it not even your enduring guardian, person responsible or a health professional. So if you have an advanced care directive, you can be sure that it needs to be followed because that's the law. Thanks, Jen. I'll make these slides available to everyone. Don't assume. You know, for me, I think both of my children know what I would like and what I would accept. Um, if decisions had to be made and I didn't have capacity. But also, they may say, I can imagine they'd say, oh, do you think mum would really like that? Or what do you think? So it takes all that horrible decision making from them and makes it very clear. Thanks, Jen. Have the conversation. Encourage people you come across to have an advanced care plan um, and as paramedics I would think that if you go in to see a patient if they had an advanced care directive that would make things much more simpler and you would know that you were doing the right thing for the choice of the person. Thanks Jen. And um, and that's it. Thank you for having me on and I hope I've made some things clear, but you can have a look at the slides later. Thank you so much, Kate. That was wonderful. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Viv Allenson, OA, uh, who's also the CEO at the Marova Aged Care Facility. Thank you so much, Viv, and thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a bit disconcerting not being able to see your faces, but anyway, uh, this is going to be more of a conversation. Uh, I'll just pick up on the last point about uh, advanced care directives and plans. Just wanted to highlight uh, when uh, the ambulance service comes into our aged care facilities, there's a very high expectation that we will have everyone signed up to an advanced care plan or a directive. But the sad news is it is very difficult to get uh, families and residents to even sit together and have that conversation, even though we offer all manner of supports to help them have that conversation. So when we do have those plans in place, it certainly makes life easier for us and we know for our health services but we just appreciate your patience um, if those documents aren't prepared because we cannot make people have those, uh, those conversations if they refuse and don't want to or are not psychologically or emotionally ready to have them. Uh, but yet, um, sadly, uh, I've even caught personal abuse from uh, the ambulance service because uh, a resident didn't have that plan in place. So it just would help uh, aged care providers if people were a little bit patient around that and understanding it's not a document we can have done and signed like an admission form, it's a personal decision for families to make. Uh, also I know it's been noted, it's been said that there is uh, limited access to GPs and I think we love the ACE service. We love the um, the way it came into being, and we know, and we love the way that it's evolved. And we know that the ambulance service uh, and its members have played a big part in the success 
of the ACE service. So I want to congratulate everyone for their participation um, and commend everyone to continue to help this service evolve. Uh, so I've been asked to talk about those challenges and sometimes um, because we don't have access to GPs, of course, we have to ring the ACE service. Um, but sometimes we don't always experience um, happiness on the other end of the phone. And, and I just appreciate that we know that when people are on the end of that phone, that they may be doing multiple roles at, at the same time as fielding calls. Uh, but we again, we would just encourage patients, because uh, we'd just like everyone to remember that the staff in our aged care services aren't all uh, RNs with 30 years experience or even 10 years experience or even 10 months experience. Uh, we have a lot of new grads, a lot of inexperienced registered nurses, and we have a lot of uh, registered nurses of other nationalities uh, where their English may not, as be, uh, may not as be as competent as yours or mine, um, though the jury might still be out on how competent my English is. Uh, but it's, uh, we just require, again, patience uh, and support, overt support for these uh, reg inexperienced registered nurses making those calls for some of them. It might be their first time to make an emergency decision or a call uh, about sending someone to a, an emergency department. So we've got to remember that we're all part of a health system and without the aged care system, we know that the, um, the acute hospital system would quickly collapse uh, because we know the minister's hopping mad about how many older people are in his services. But I think he forgets that they're our services, the community services, and everyone has right, a right to access those services. So we uh, would just like to see uh, the people on the end of the phone within the aged care service uh, just be treated with some uh, dignity and respect. And I have to say, for the very most part, that is the case. As I talk to my staff, um, they report uh, that not just kindness, but just uh, respect um, and good positive inquiry when they uh, contact the ACE team. And similarly, uh, when the ambulance team co comes to the aged care service, uh, for the most part, uh, my staff report um, that they, everyone is treated with respect, that they endeavour to treat the ambulance team with respect and support what they need. Uh, and we just ask for uh, reciprocal uh, generosity in those arrangements. And we know that people will have a bad day, uh, as I have, I think there's some, might, even if there might be some of those people on the call there where I've uh, had to thump the desk uh, out of absolute frustration because we couldn't get support for one of our very um, seriously mentally ill residents. Uh, but those times, uh, hopefully a few and far between. Sometimes uh, with callbacks, um, the staff, uh, have reported that they've, when they've left a message with, for, the, for ACE, uh, it's been a 45 minute wait and they've in, intervened themselves and made a clinical decision to call an ambulance uh, without waiting for that call back. Uh, for instance, with a resident that was having a cerebral bleed or a stroke or something uh, where they felt the action was needed before they waited for that call back. Um, and I think sometimes, uh, again, in that moment of when people ring and when people are doing uh, other jobs at the time of taking the call from the aged care service, it's really important to try and put those things aside uh, and just hear out what the person has to say and take into consideration uh, if they're experienced or inexperienced. Uh, sometimes the calls go on to GP access. Um, and often what the, the findings are there is when they do that, the GP access nurse just says, oh, look, just ring the ambulance and just gives them permission to do that anyway. Um, so uh, sometimes we don't know if ACE is manned or not, but most times we get these fantastic emails to say, just letting you all know uh, that 
the ACE service is not available over these hours or overnight or, or whatever it is due to staffing challenges. And we really appreciate that. And that just shows a, a respect and cooperation uh, with all the users of the service um, that everyone values our time as much as we are trying to value your time. Uh, and then sometimes we also get a fax if uh, when we do make a call, uh, ACE will sometimes send a fax to the ED mostly. Uh, and we sometimes also get the same fax so that they've got an early alert because we want uh, our EDs to be ready and prepared for when our residents arrive because like you, we don't want them uh, sitting in, in the hospital ED or an ambulance trolley any longer than is necessary. We want them to be assessed as quickly as possible and return back to the service as quickly as possible. Um, and sometimes, and I, I think in your slides, Ros, uh, you were pointing out some of the scenarios uh, where it's, it's quite critical and so if you hear at Maroba, um, we would sometimes just ring the ambulance direct, directly. Uh, say for instance, if it's a trauma, a serious trauma, we would then, and then we would advise ACE. Um, we're using our clinical judgment and trying to get the quickest response for a traumatized, physically traumatized resident uh, as best we can. Uh, something I think is important to note um, with families, and I, I don't know that everyone appreciates this, we, you, we've had a Royal Commission uh, into aged care and that was titled Neglect. And where did that neglect alleged to have occurred? It was at the bedside, but I just want to assure everybody um, the funding to the bedside is not spectacular in any stretch of anyone's imagination. There's been a lot of funding recently thrown at different other aspects of the aged care service and business model uh, around accommodation and hospitality, but there's been very little being put to the bedside. But as you can imagine, families and some residents have a heightened uh, awareness about that neglect or the potential for that neglect. So we often have families here and we've been we've been castigated by one of our local hospitals for this. A, a resident had become unstable and we made a decision that a, a, a registered nurse hadn't been with us very long, had spoken to a senior people and, and people agreed we yes send this gentleman because the family was now demanding that he be sent to hospital. We tried to say, well, look, we would like to monitor him for longer, but no, no, he, he needs to go to hospital. So I think our hospital colleagues uh, in the acute sector and the ambulance service don't always appreciate that when we have a patient, or you call them a patient, we call them a resident, we don't just have that resident to deal with. We have a whole family uh, and their decision makers uh, connected to that care. We don't get funded to manage the all the extended parties involved in the care, but we have to manage it. And where a family is escalated and fears recalling what they heard and saw through the Royal Commission about how people were denied access to hospital, denied intervention from the ambulance service or anything else, not by the ambulance service, but by the aged care facility, refusing to send them to hospital. We, you've got to keep in mind that that is terrifying for a family. And sometimes we have to act on not on our best uh, experience and knowledge and expertise. We have to act on uh, we have a family here that it, uh, if anything happened to this person that was later deemed to have been avoidable or uh, should could have been managed in an acute setting, uh, you, you have no idea what that will mean for the family in their distress moving forward and also for the healthcare professionals within the aged care service of what they uh, will have to manage and deal with. And it just... It, it's awful when you uh, you turn up every day to do a great job and to make a difference to older people 
and then you'll have someone turn from a bad experience and just keep blaming that individual. We're losing people in the healthcare sector. We're losing people in aged care because of the fear of those things happening. So bear with us when we have to send someone that we think, okay, look, 50-50, we keep them here, but we have a family demanding that they go into care. There's my time up, I believe. Uh, so I am happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Viv. That was really enlightening. And it's really great that you were able to share with us, I suppose, the demands and especially the families. Yeah, that's really hard. Thank yes, you. it can be very challenging. And we've got to keep a lot of people happy. I might have 144 residents, but I've actually got 500 when you add <laughs> the families to those. The families, so that's sure. Yeah, that's right. So do we have anybody online who'd like to ask a question? There's one question that I can see that, um, can paramedics use the ACE line to speak to, um, to ACE? And so with that, what we normally, I know what, currently occurs um, that the uh, paramedics get the registered nurse from the uh, facility to ring to ring ACE and we're happy to chat you know if you want to have a conversation and I think sometimes it's really important and especially like with Viv um, mentioned in relation to the expectations of families sometimes it's good to have that we need to have that knowledge as well so we can support the facility you know, with and and to reassure the family that the facility does provide excellent care and um, they are able you know they have access to um, to the ACE line they have access to the emergency department but it may and talk through that why it is best for the person to remain in the facility if it is not necessarily for that individual to be transferred to hospital. So if you wish to call the ACE line, I see why not, yeah. I think that's a great point, Roz, um, about the uh, ambulance service personnel supporting that conversation uh, with families. Uh, I think that is great. And, you know, if all parties are involved in helping us with that conversation, it will be a better outcome for everyone. Exactly. Thanks, Viv. And I think that's the only question that I can see that hasn't been. Oh, there's lots of questions. What is the ACE number? Um, the ACE number is. I will remain on me. 130 I think that's right. Yeah. Lucky I remembered. But I can put that in the chat. Oh. Will you be expecting, will you be expanding out to small towns in the New England, especially because of the lack of available doctors in the local health systems? At this stage, we're, um, of course, we, we at the moment, ACE will not be further extended as such. And I suppose for us, it is a nurse-led model, as Lee said, but also we have access to medical governance. And so many of these um, facilities, and if you're talking about the smaller towns up in New England, so you're probably talking about Glen Innes and um, Tenderfield and those hospitals. And at the moment, they don't have a consistent uh, medical support, so therefore access for the ED nurses to medical officers for that um, you know, clinical discussion is not available. So at this stage, we will not be rolling out um, ACE as such to the smaller sites, I'm sorry. Um, ACE number, right here. Thanks for that. Um, we have recorded, Mark, and we will um, put it up on the PHN website where you can um, access the recording, okay. Um, can I make a call? Yes. 
And I think that's all the questions we have. So thank you so much to everybody. We really, I think it's wonderful that we're able to share um, with you all the information around the ACE service, but also realise that we have a, it, it has to be a multi-organisational input. We have the input from um, the aged care facilities, from ambulance and from the hospitals and from the ACE clinicians and Hunter Primary Care and the PHN. And if we all work together and support each other, we will be able to um, provide the best care we can in the right place for our older people in um, the aged care facility. So thank you all for tuning in. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everybody um, for attending today. Um, Ros, just before you go, there was one more question that came in. Is there a minimum age for an advanced care directive? No, no, um, no. you have to be legal. Um, um, you have to have capacity. So obviously an adult. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I have put a link to our website to the education library in the follow up email. So when you get that, um, that'll direct you to where the webinar will be uploaded. Uh, it will probably happen tomorrow. Thanks, everyone, for attending and we'll see you next time.